They don't have wireless mics for us, so I'll be basically doing a little bit of podium hugging today. I apologize in advance. Um, I guess we can go ahead and get started. Uh, this is the state of Drupal DevOps. Um, if you're in the wrong room, you're going to realize it really quick. Um, a lot of people uh, have all kinds of interesting responses when they hear the word DevOps. Some are good, some are bad, some are confusion, some are you're crazy, some are you don't know what you're talking about, um, and everything in between. The best one, though, is when the operations people stand up and say, I've been doing this my entire life. Why are you calling it something I've never heard? Um, so it's a neat little balance. Um, this is DrupalCon Austin. If you were confused about that, I cannot help. Um, my name is Kevin Bridges. Uh, on the internet, I'm kind of known as CyberSWAT. I'm director of technology at a company called New Media Denver. Uh, New Media Denver is a very interesting place. Uh, we are specializing in DevOps implementations. We are specializing in consulting uh, management workflow issues, uh, deployment issues, things that we have seen in the enterprise repeatedly have been able to isolate and help people with. Uh, so let's get right into it. Uh, basically, CyberSWAT does not mean what you think that it does. I know that lots of people have neat connotations that they associate with that, but it's not what you think. Um, I'm not a Drupal developer or a DevOps engineer. Uh, that's going to be shocking to a lot of people. I used to be quite good at Drupal. I am no longer quite good at Drupal. But I can help out with implementing it, I can help out with deploying it, and I can make it run really well. Um, I'm an open source technologist. Pure and simple. Uh, DevOps is not equivalent to open source. So if you walk into a DevOps conversation and you think that somebody is going to immediately start having the same conversations that a typical open source developer will have, you are wrong. Um, there's reasons for that. I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that DevOps kind of sprang from the enterprise. Um, in reality, Drupal knows about DevOps specifically because we have people that had to maintain our success. So as developers, we got larger, we were doing bigger sites. Eventually those bigger sites started working with more ingrained operations teams. Those teams had to figure out what this Drupal thing was. Um, they had to figure out what memcache was. They had to figure out what a whole host of things were that were specific to our environment. Our code is not written very performant. Um, tends to take a little bit more resources to operate than most systems. I'm also the director of technology at New Media Denver, uh, basically covered that. As far as Drupal's concerned, I've worked on some pretty interesting sites, uh, worked uh, uh, with a lot of really good people along the way and was able to do a lot of really neat things. One of the first big ones, I think, for the Drupal community in general was uh, Popular Science. We launched that very early on. It was uh, one of the very first Drupal 6 sites that hit the, the airwaves. Um, and it was well received. Um, we did some very extensive write-ups about it, really tried to use open source to help people understand how it, we did what we did and what they needed to do to reproduce what we did. Um, and I think that's the first time that anybody wrote a case study to that magnitude or for that goal on Drupal.org. Um, another site that I was heavily involved in was examiner.com. Uh, basically, uh, we launched examiner.com a couple months before Drupal 7 was released. Uh, had a very interesting team of people uh, working on it, some very talented individuals as well. Uh, we started introducing things like MongoDB at that time. Uh, basically, uh, examiner.com is a top 50 website property um, in the United States. It was a high traffic scenario. It involved many servers, many people, and a lot of organization. Um, basically became a release manager at a certain point during that process to be able to, to start bridging that gap between what we needed to do to keep the site running, what we needed to do to get our releases out there, and, and everything in between. Um, that also involved things like talking to a very focused and very opinionated uh, development team that very much had things that they were accustomed to doing that needed to change to be able to grow. So it was a combination of managing technical and managing people, and two totally different things. Um, and then I moved right into the top secret space. Uh, yeah. That is a bit of a pain point for me because I can't talk about what it is that I do um, as a result of that. And I'm an open source developer. I didn't get in this to be top secret. I got in this because I enjoy talking, I enjoy teaching, I enjoy doing what I do, and I'm doing it to make the world a better place. When I have a top secret project, it doesn't tend to necessarily, necessarily align with all of those 
I, I think, principles that I'm looking for. Um, I've worked at some neat companies along the way, a company called Ping Vision very early on, uh, definitely not the same company today. Um, worked at a company called Bonnier Corporation, Bonnier Corporation, uh, 250 year old Swede, Swedish company, uh, basically helped them set up a system as a result of doing PopSci to migrate all the rest of their magazines from Java based CMS platforms over to Drupal. So lots of vignette, lots of data migrations, lots of repetitive work. Um, it was a very interesting project to be involved with, met some really cool people there too. Uh, ended up working for another company called Clarity Digital. People uh, might or might not know who that is, but it's a large company as well. And then worked for, ironically, uh, Acquia. So I've also done some things with DrupalCon. I've served as a code track chair and a DevOps track chair for multiple DrupalCons. I've been involved since DrupalCon Denver uh, on a DrupalCon level. Uh, I'm no longer involved. Uh, that, that's a hard pace to maintain. Uh, each project basically led me more into DevOps and further and further from open source. And, and again, that's just a, a huge pain point for me. I don't understand that. It just drives me crazy, and we'll get to that a little bit more. Um, I'm on my, my way back to open source, and I'm bringing DevOps with me. So basically, the intent of what I'm doing, why I'm presenting this data, why I'm standing up here and talking about DevOps, even though everybody hates the word DevOps, is because it's a necessity. Somebody has to do it. We have to talk, we have to communicate, we have to start working together, and if we're not, then we're missing great opportunities. So, mandatory, we're hiring plug. If anybody likes what I say, if you don't like what I say, if you can do what I'm saying better, come talk to me, please, um, because I want to work with you. If you can contribute to this conversation, even if you're running another company, come talk to me. There is things that we can do together to make this whole system a better thing. Um, so this is gonna be done a little bit differently. Basically, we're dealing with a lot of data. So I'm gonna do it the open source way, which is a little bit different. Um, here's an example. I sent an email to uh, uh, Gene Kim. Uh, Gene Kim is a very prolific uh, blogger. He works at Puppet Labs. Um, he wrote the Phoenix Project, uh, which is an awesome book. If you guys haven't read it, if you need to understand the principles of DevOps, go out and buy that book. Basically what they do in that book is they equate what we do in the technology space, what we think is so new unique, to old school industry practices. So they literally took a 1920s manual that talked about how to move a production line from point A to point B, um, and how to find bottlenecks in that production line, how to identify weak points, and how to get your team to work together. This is not rocket science. This is stuff that the human race has been doing for a very long time. They basically replaced a box with a computer and rewrote the book. It's very interesting. Um, all of the data that I'm gonna show you is up on this project page right now. So if you go to drupal.org project DevOps underscore survey, you will be able to download the database. It's a scrub database of all the respondents. There is a PDF document that has a lot more data that's in the slide. Um, you will be able to dissect it and the data scientists in the room will be able to tell me everything that I did wrong with what I'm about to present. And I look forward to that conversation. Please make use of this data. Um, the goal is that we need to track metrics. We need to be able to identify where we have come from, what we are doing, and where we are going. And until we can do those three things as a community, then we're just kind of lost. Another one, uh, this presentation. If you don't like the way I talk, you can download this presentation from github.com newmediadenver slash presentations. It's already up and online. Everything that I do goes into the public space because our organization has identified that if you want to be truly successful, you need to be able to separate what makes you a unique snowflake and what those structural components are. And you need to develop workflows that help your engineers and your operations people and everybody in between become public facing figures. If you're doing DevOps correctly, if you're separating your data from your structure and you're not being forced into a business situation where you have to cut corners, you have to keep that snowflake data, then you're basically going to instill a workflow where you have the ability to get more efficient at what you're doing. You're starting to work in very structured ways and it changes everything. It's, it's very slow at first, it takes a little bit to get going, but it's worth the effort. Um, basically think of it like Pilates, right? So the first time that you start doing Pilates, or at least for me, I thought it was just ridiculous. Couldn't move, couldn't do anything. I, I didn't know what the hell was going on. Um, ended up 
started doing it for a couple weeks, stuck with it. I'm a stubborn person. I don't quit very well. Um, eventually, it got to the point where it started being okay. wasn't totally comfortable with it, but eventually, I got to that point where it was like, well, why haven't I been doing this my entire life? I mean, I'm losing weight. I'm more active. I'm thinking better. This just makes no sense that I wasn't doing this thing before. DevOps is that. DevOps is very painful at first. You have to understand it. You have to define it. And then you have to look at yourself. You have to do introspection. You have to find out what your organization is, what your organization is trying to accomplish. And then you have to give it the right tools, the right workflow, and the right methodologies to accomplish it. If you're not doing those in an open space, then you're recreating the wheel. And your organization is investing a lot of money in you doing that. So basically what ends up happening is the moment that you think that you're, you're unique, you're, you're really not, and you're spending a lot of money, and you're not being as, as efficient as you could be. It's a very interesting paradigm. It, it just starts to resonate after a little while. So um, again, back to I'm going to say a lot of crazy things during this presentation. I expect people to tell me where I'm wrong. I look forward to it because I know that everything that I'm saying is likely wrong. I'm only a person. I'm just trying to figure this out. I have a little bit of data that I've been able to collect to help make some points, um, but show me where I mess up and let's talk. Uh, in room 10B, uh, Blink Reaction, uh, this Thursday, 1045 to 1145, I have box scheduled. Um, there's some conversations that I want to engage in there. So let's get down to it. What is DevOps? Survey says... Oh, that they actually did a, there was a survey going on at the same time from the DevOps. People, uh, I, I have not answered that because I do have a lot of respect for DevOps, but I had no idea what they were talking about. <laughs> no, right. We are like, what's that? <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's what Drupal thinks of DevOps, basically, um, through and through. Uh, and it's an interesting paradigm because the people that can benefit the most from using DevOps are, are the people that have no idea what's going on with DevOps. Um, and it, the challenge that I've been finding is that it's a very tactful and, and deliberate conversation to be able to have somebody understand, number one, that they need DevOps, number two, how to do it, and then number three, how it can impact them directly. What tends to happen is, is something totally different. But let's get back to the presentation. What is DevOps? We need to define that, right? I mean, that's why we're here. So let's ask everybody that took the survey, what is DevOps? Survey says... What the fuck was that? <laughs> um, so basically what that was, uh, was a dev cloud or uh, word cloud of everybody's response. The people that claim to know DevOps, the people that claim to implement DevOps, they can't even tell you what DevOps is because DevOps is not a thing. It's a buzzword. It's a marketing term. It is designed to get you to think about what you're doing in a different way than what you're accustomed to doing. It's the same thing as Agile all over again. Um, it's quite interesting. Most people throw DevOps around like it's just a thing. I'm sure most of you have seen the DevOps in a box video. If you haven't, Google for it. It is phenomenal. Um, it is, it's, people are making a joke of it now. So there, there are schools of thought that say, I will not even consider your company if you say that you're hiring a DevOps engineer. I will not consider you if you say that you are a DevOps practitioner because you don't get it. And I disagree with that, but we'll get to that later. So why are we here? Because we all need virtualized dev environments. I read the session proposals for DrupalCon many times. Um, it tends to be a natural first step for development shops to want to virtualize their development environments. So here's typically how that, that happens. And in this tweet, I just, oh my goodness. Um, here, I'll slow down. So this tweet is a very typical tweet from a very smart person who I admire greatly. Um, he is trying to get started in vagrant development. He's associated with Drupal. He doesn't say that he wants to do Drupal here. He's just saying local vagrant development. So what immediately happens is you get all kinds of cool comments that are, are really helpful. Um, <laughs> yeah, again, helpful. And then you get some even more knowledgeable people in the virtualization space basically schlepping their, their solution that they've been using for X amount of time without ever asking the original poster, 
why he wanted to use Vagrant in the first place, or what he was trying to accomplish from it, or what his long-term vision was, or anything like that. Um, so immediately start getting recommendations, oh, that I should jump in and download this. Uh, he's already starting to feel a little bit overwhelmed. He needs a session at DrupalCon. I think that's a great idea. Uh, but what are we going to talk about? I mean, all that I've heard is vagrant and virtualization. How does that apply to anything? Um, and it goes on and on. You get, you know, uh, un yeah, sorry about that. Um, but basically what ended up happening is there are a lot of good solutions out there. There's a lot of people working on this problem because all of us are dealing with it every single day. If you're running a development shop, I'm sure that, and I have the data to back it up, that you've realized that virtualization is becoming a thing. Docker is going to come up pretty soon. Core OS is going to be evolved. There's a lot of neat stuff happening in this space right now. People need to use this stuff. But where do you start? What do you do? It, it, it's pretty interesting. And basically what it leads to is eventually this. Complete and total option paralysis. You have no idea what's going on. You think you're happy because you just learned a lot of stuff. And in the end, you're laying on the floor not doing anything. Um, so it's pretty interesting. I don't know. Maybe I'm stretching, I don't know, but I don't think that I am. So let's try it again. Why are we here? Maybe we'll get it right this time. It's real simple. We're here because of culture, automation, measurement, and sharing. Those of you in the DevOps space know this as CAMS. Um, this is the simplest definition that you will ever get. Doesn't even say DevOps anywhere. Doesn't even have those letters in it. But this is everything that DevOps is. This is everything that we accomplish through the agile movement, through being able to communicate more efficiently. There's schools of thought that say that silos are bad, but silos, you know, as Kevin Barrett said in a recent presentation, have been around since the days of Plato. Get over it. They're going to be an enterprise. You need them to succeed in enterprise. If you don't understand that, then you're probably missing a couple of points. Um, so what does that bring us back to? It brings us back to sharing. The enterprises, the companies, the organizations that are capable of understanding what their snowflake business model is and what their structure is are the ones that are going to be successful. So we still haven't really quite nailed down DevOps as it relates to the Drupal community. Um, this is uh, notorious in so many ways. Um, but basically, for this story, I'm going to tell you, uh, basically, just think of DevOps as bananas, right? Pretty simple. They're really sweet. They're really good. They're really nutritious. They have a lot of value to certain types of people. Those types of people tend to be monkeys. Um, these monkeys like their bananas a lot. They basically find out eventually that in order to succeed, in order to survive, you need to eat bananas because it's the only food on the island. If you're eating your bananas, you're able to do other work, you're able to do other things. Eventually, that monkey gets smart. He's like, man, these bananas are good. So I'm going to tell my friends about these bananas. And these little monkeys are all starting to get together. They're starting to share. They're starting to talk. They're like, hey, these bananas, they're so great. I can do X, Y, and Z with them. Here, let me show you how to do that. And it starts to grow. It starts to spread. But what ends up happening along the way is monkeys start getting bigger. Eventually, you get a couple little gorillas in there. So those gorillas now are pretty good at moving bananas around. They're pretty adequate at what they do. They understand the value in what they are doing. So they're helping out more and more monkeys. It's still a little innocuous. It doesn't really mean anything right now. It's just a couple of monkeys helping each other. But eventually, monkeys turn into gorillas. And at some point, you have a couple of gorillas that are pretty dominant in the space. Um, and what ends up happening in a scenario like this, if you look at it very carefully, you have a lot of monkeys that are pretty happy. They're doing some pretty neat stuff. They're impressive. They are really working well together. But you have a couple of gorillas on top of it that are progressively hiding what it is that is making these monkeys so good. They're, in essence, becoming a barrier to those bananas because they're standing in the way. They, they, they need more sustenance. They need more fuel. They need more everything. So they're bigger, they're larger, they're meaner. Um, and basically what ends up happening is they stop you from getting to those bananas. And you can't share them. You can't talk about them because the perception is that those bananas are basically the business model. So if I give you my business model, how the hell am I going to compete? How am I going to you know, 
pay my employees if I can't have something that's unique? Um, so let, let me ask you a question. Just kind of, we'll go back to technology for a minute. It, how many of you have installed Apache? Okay, everybody in the room except for Jeff. Uh, <laughs> but that's cool, because I know he has. Um, how many of you used a config file when you installed Apache? Everybody in the room. So basically, the act of putting a config file in place for Apache to read is not unique. It's not. There's a number of ways of accomplishing that. So let's break that out. Let's say, hey, if you're working with Apache, guess what? You're going to need a config file. Guess what? It should probably look like this. And hey, here's one step further. I have tests that will support it. I have tests that will work in X, Y, and Z. These tests abstract what it is that I'm talking about. And because we have slowed down and broken cycles, we're doing test-driven development now, we have the ability to say in plain English what this thing does. So the next time that, let's say, a business person comes along who knows nothing about technology, they can query your tests and get a clear, plain English definition that Apache put that file in place. And that file's needed to configure Apache. Done. I know what the system does now. Why don't we have that for Drupal? I mean, seriously. We all do the same stuff. We use Vagrant. We use, some of us use Vagrant. We use all kinds of caching technologies. We use APC. We use PHP. We use Apache. We use Nginx. We use all kinds of stuff. And we tend to do it pretty consistently. So why are we all reinventing the wheel? Gorilla attraction forms silos, plain and simple. The nice thing about or the interesting thing about that particular silo is that those monkeys are so ingrained with supporting those gorillas that they will never be able to go anywhere else. Um, so it's effectively a trap. Um, it's unfortunate. Open source changes silos. That's why I got involved with Drupal. That's why I'm here today. Not because I'm supporting silos, but because I'm supporting open source. It changes the world. We need to start doing it. So why a survey? This is very interesting to me. Um, how many of you have heard of DevOps Days? A couple people. Um, DevOps Days is a global conference, much like DrupalCon, except that it happens more frequently. It's done on an open source model. Anybody can step up, organize a quick event, and it's kind of like Drupal Camps. Um, they're getting a lot of penetration. This happens to be one of the organizers of, of DevOps Days. His name is Chris Boitart. Um, this is him approximately two years ago. Uh, Morton posted a post asking people what they thought about voting on DrupalCon sessions because there's this interesting stigma that it is almost impossible to present for a DrupalCon because you have to be one of those phenomenal rock stars to be able to do anything. And let, let me tell you right now, my experience from doing the number of code reviews that I have and working with the teams that I have is that if you have somebody that is in your team that is a rock star, then your code needs to be fixed plain and simple. Um, there is no need for a rock star anywhere. It's a code smell. Um, but this gentleman spent a little bit of time trying to penetrate the Drupal community. He is now the DevOps chair for the European uh, track. And if you look real carefully at how North America and Europe are organizing the DevOps track, it is intensely interesting. Uh, and by that, I mean I believe that people like Chris came to the Drupal community because we made them. We gave enterprising operations people tools that they needed to fix. Um, so they had to learn about our stuff. They had to introduce us to DevOps, and they had to do what they needed to do to help elevate us as a community so that they could stay sane. And I think it's our turn to reciprocate. So let's just get right into the data. I've said my craziness for the day. Um, I'm going to let you guys reflect on that for a little while. Um, and I'm going to get into the data as much as I can. So uh, basically what we have, and I'll just talk about where this data came from real quickly, is an uh, open source project called Lime Survey. It's in an XML format. Um, I sent Chris an email. He sent me uh, the XML format. Uh, we have both versions on that Drupal.org project page. Um, I would really love to see somebody pick this up at some point in the future, maybe use it in a future DrupalCon, or use it in their business, or write presentations about it and tell us what it is that we're doing right and doing wrong. And there's some very interesting things that can be gleaned from this. Um, the first thing that we're seeing uh, between these two years is that we are experiencing consistent growth in site management and site building. Um, it, it's, it's 
pretty straightforward. I mean, these are who are you kind of questions. These are the types of organizations that are growing right now. Um, we're also seeing across the board, you know, going back to this gorilla concept, we're seeing a decrease in client self-hosting sites. Um, it's becoming more difficult for a client to self-host their site. They have to run a host of technologies. A lot of people don't have the bandwidth or the capacity to do it. They're busy fighting that Drupal cliff and trying to become rock stars. Um, so it's an interesting paradigm. Um, there's that word. The number of people pulled into DevOps is on par with the number of people that introduced DevOps. I find that to be exceedingly interesting, particularly because what it means is that for you're almost getting an, an equal response of people that are introducing a new technology, having this conversation, changing the way people think, talking to their engineering buddies and having them think about things a little bit differently, and you're accomplishing great things, and it's spreading. So as you're planting a seed, another one's popping up, whether it wants to or not, and eventually the idea is that these things take root and, and, and really change organizations. That's why we are here. That's why we do DevOps. According to the Drupal community, we no longer need to explain why DevOps. I mean, if you look at it, this one here, no, why should I use DevOps? What the heck is it? 33% of the respondents in 2012 said, why? I don't even understand what you're talking about. In 2014, I had one response that said why. And I'm pretty sure based on who put it in there, it was a sarcastic response. Um, so that says a lot about where we are, where we've been coming from, and we'll get to where we're going in a little bit. Um, but that comes back to the tenets of DevOps. You have to measure to be able to have the right conversation with the right people at the right time. And if you're not prepared to do that, you're going to reinvent the wheel, you're going to work harder than you need to work, and you need to solve that, in my opinion. So about your site. Uh, is your current production site up to date? Uh, basically, this is a security question. How many outstanding security issues do you have? Uh, that we know about. 87% um, of respondents are subscribed to Drupal Security News. Uh, that is pretty good. Um, I think that's up from, I think it was in the 60s when they first asked this question. So I was pretty excited about that. The percentage of sites that are up to date for core only decreased by 13%. So basically, that could be read a couple of different ways. The way that I'm going to state it until somebody proves me wrong is that people are getting better at maintaining contrib. Um, the percentage of sites that are up to date for both core and contrib have increased by 8%. Seems pretty positive. The percentage of sites that are not up to date at all has increased by 4%. So basically, what this is telling us is that we seem to have a difficult time keeping up. We're not doing DevOps properly, and we're not teaching it properly because the people still cannot keep up. And if there is anything to know about Drupal, it is a very public piece of software. There is a lot of security issues with it. You need to be aware of them. You need to keep your sites up to date. Otherwise, we'll have something like what happened with WordPress, and all the Drupal sites become a bot farm, basically. We kind of don't want that. So. Basically, um, as we talk more and more about site development, we start seeing some trends. Uh, more people are developing using multiple environments. We're starting to see really good use of, of devs, staging, testing, those types of environments pop up. People are hearing the conversation. They're understanding what it is that we're doing. Their efficiency in that process is, is probably the next conversation, but at least they're listening. This highlights the need for consistency between environments. And this goes back to testing and being able to define what it is that you're doing, not only from an engineering perspective, but what is that thing that you're doing from a security perspective? What is that thing that you're doing from a metrics perspective? If I introduce that to my system, how do I send a notification to the right ops person that they're going to need to tweak something in Varnish, for example, to be able to keep up with me, or they need to spin it up another machine? They have to have some sort of an indic indicator, and I think that if you're doing test-driven development and you're doing possibly behavior-driven development, depending on your type of organization, that you have mechanisms to be able to make that type of connection, send that type of signal, and communicate with those people efficiently. 8% of respondents are still deploying critical changes on production first or unaware of what a critical fix is. 
that says a lot. I mean, that maybe that's your, you know, where I started in, in my basement writing Drupal sites, uh, working on one site. It's all I had. It's all I could afford. I couldn't do anything else. So maybe that's that crowd. I don't know. It's a, a disconcerting number to me. Um, I don't think that anybody should not know how to update a Drupal site. So these are fun slides, and, and, and I say that these are fun slides because let, let's step back from the presentation for a minute. There, there's a, a very active conversation going on right now, and I've kind of hinted a, a, at the concept of code smells, where you think that what you're doing is so unique that it can't possibly fit into anybody else's pattern. There's a certain level of blindness that happens once you make that assumption, and, and, and I've seen great improvements happen when people can remove that blindness. Um, so we'll just continue on for a little bit more. 96% uh, of respondents utilize version control. Um, you'll notice that this chart is starting to move quite a bit. Um, in 2012, it was not that. Uh, we definitely had um, people that were a little diversified in how they actually use version control. Um, but it's changing. It's getting fixed. Basically, what's wrong with the other 4%? I don't understand how you can exist in today's world and not use version control. I mean, just for your sanity. But that's neither here nor there. So remember the time, amount of time that we spent bike shedding the migration to get. How many people actually remember that conversation? It, it went on for months and months and months, and we are still bike shedding about it and still talking about it and still arguing about it. And I've had some of the most brilliant people in the Drupal community come into organizations and make recommendations about things like source control because it's what they're comfortable with, but they don't, they're engineers, right? They, they don't really balance the people aspect. And if you're noticing a trend where most of the world is doing something else and you're not willing to participate there, then you might be short-circuiting your effectiveness. Um, and we see that pretty clearly in the next slide. 94% of respondents now use Git. What this tells me is I don't ever have to ask this question again. We can stop talking about Git versus CVS versus SVN. If you're not doing it with 94% of the community supporting that decision, then that's your prerogative. Have a nice day. I'm going to stick with the 94%. SVN is the next closest with 2%. Interesting, all the ones that were relevant disappeared. Um, they weren't even a line item. Um, so that says how quickly this industry changes. And that's also one of the traps that we all need to be aware of, is the second that somebody like me stands up here and tells you that something is a certain way, it's changing already. Um, your technology, your code, the things that you implement as workflows, you need to remove emotional attachments and understand how to utilize those things in a way that is effective for what it is that you're trying to accomplish. And I can guarantee you that you will be a better developer and a better person as a result of it. It's very interesting. So about site development. The use of continua continuous integration platforms is increasing. Um, everybody's heard Jenkins. Uh, it's consistently outperforming other platforms in adoption. Um, that tends to be, I think, because of you know things like open source or human nature. You start talking about a complicated problem, you, a couple of people start putting forth a lot of effort, they come up with a reasonable solution, a couple more people start talking about that, they all start understanding it better, and then it starts spreading, until eventually it's such a, a known commodity that, that everybody's just kind of doing it. You saw that happen with Git, I think you're going to see similar things here, depending on your level of enterpriseness. Um, <laughs> so, let's keep going. The types of tests we run are relatively consistent over time. And those of you that are data scientists and very well versed in this type of thing will note immediately that this should probably be a bar chart. Um, I'm not a data scientist. I just use Google Docs and click buttons, and this is what came out, so please fix it. Um, but what is interesting here is that you'll notice that the breakup of this particular chart doesn't really fluctuate that much. What that tells me um, is that we basically know what it is that we're testing, how we're going to go about doing it, um, and those technologies are not in flux. It's a two-year time span, so why even have those qu questions anymore? It, from a Drupal perspective, it seems like we're most interested in performance, followed by usability, followed by GUI testing. 
Um, so what that tells me is that if I want to be very effective at supporting Drupal teams, that I should probably find some way to do those three things effectively and maybe let the rest of them slide for a little bit. Um, not forever, but if I'm communicating properly, if I'm doing it in an open source way and I'm putting this stuff out there, then other people can use it, other people can adopt it, and I won't have to have this conversation again. I have three very good ways of doing X, Y, and Z, and let's collaborate. So site development. The use of testing frameworks is increasing. That is awesome. Operations people, I don't know if any of you have ever seen it. There's a, a DevOps GIF, basically, that shows the difference between a script written, written by a system administrator and a script written by a programmer. The system administrator script looks like something out of Terminator. It's this gargantuan robot that's just stomping around, and then you look at what the developer wrote, and it's this very precise thing that's moving marbles very rapidly, very precise. Um, it's a very interesting paradigm, and I think that one of the things that is being ingrained is that frameworks, open source, what we're doing as a community is applicable across the board, and it's being adopted. Selenium right now leads the pack. That ties back to the fact that we are very interested in usability testing. We are very interested in GUI testing. We're very interested in what those button clickers are capable of doing. Um, Cucumber has increased by 2%. Behavior-driven development is an interesting paradigm. There's an entire school of thought as to whether or not it's applicable to technology or if it's just applicable to business. Um, but in both cases, there's value, and it should be considered. BHAT is the biggest mover at, at almost 7%, and straight up yay Symphony for so many reasons. I mean, the Symphony's introducing the Drupal community to how to write tests properly. It's helping provide frameworks that are used by others. Um, it's giving us structure and helping the entire community learn things that are removing blinders that are helping them think out of the box. Um, BHAT is one of the most phenomenal things out of this, in my opinion. Um, another good thing about uh, Symphony in the general direction of Drupal 8 right now is that, you know, configs are starting to go into files. It's about time. I can start s sourcing this stuff. It's great. So, continuing with site development, more developers are working locally. What you're seeing here is basically a, a decrease in live production work. Um, you're seeing a decrease in working on, on staging environments. You're seeing a decrease in working on development environments, but you are seeing people bringing stuff further and further back in, which goes back to that tweet. You would need to be able to do that efficiently. Everybody's doing it. Everybody's starting to do it. These systems are coming online. They're active. They're live. They're doing what they're supposed to be doing, and the developers are reacting, and this is a sign of that. Yeah, and back to consistency for environments. Basically, um, I, I was talking to a gentleman uh, at the booth the other day, and he came up to me and said that I have a vendor that I'm working with, and I have a particular issue where I tested on two or three environments that I have, and I push it up following their procedures. Doesn't work in their production environment, works in every other environment up to that point and they won't give me any logs. I can't see what's going on. I can't adjust anything that I'm working on. I have to wait for a ticket from some deep, dark department inside of this, this organization, and I haven't gotten a response. I can't get a response. It's like black air, or black, well, no, black box. There you go. That's what that's called. It's not open source. It's, it's disconcerting. And again, this slide kind of highlights the growth you'll see here in this 12.9% uh, that virtualization is increasing. Whether or not people are doing it right, whether or not people are understanding it, whether or not people are sending people down the wrong path by making recommendations that aren't properly thought out, it's increasing. We need to deal with it. We need to accept all those scenarios, and we need to make it work. So basically, this is an awesome slide. Because what we're seeing across the board is that when we're asking people how do you configure your modules, people are starting to do it the right way, and it is about time. I do not enjoy logging into a site and having to click into the admin page to configure a module. I don't think anybody should ever have to do that unless they're testing something out. 
Um, but what we're seeing is that features is bridging this gap considerably for Drupal 7. Um, we're seeing adoption of features uh, come up 18% in a two-year time period. And that's pretty substantial. That's huge. Manual configuration changes from the GUI are down 27%. Apparently, people don't like clicking buttons either, at least the people that are willing to fill out this survey. Site profile installations have improved from less than 1% which blows my mind, to 6%. How many of you use site install profiles when you deploy Drupal? A fair number of people in here. There is no way to programmatically install a site without that in some capacity. You're either doing a database dump, you're starting from a certain point. Um, it's, it's, it's really a shame if you're not using an install profile and you're not doing it in a way that it's reusable for your organization, particularly if your organization's responsibility is to deal with clients. Um, I, I'll stop there. <laughs> database installations have decreased by 9%. What that means is people dumping database from local, let's schlep it up to production or wherever else. That is the worst possible way to install a Drupal site, and I really do hope that nobody's doing it here. If you need clarification on that, come talk to me afterwards and, and we'll sit down. Heavy use of features has increased by 9%. Um, so basically what that's saying is that in those install profiles, it's likely that you're going to find some features work there. And features is doing some great things in this space right now. Features, strong arm, those, those are all fantastic tools. They can get a little unwieldy sometimes, but it is the best that we have right now. So what's behind Drupal? It's safe to say that Apache and Nginx are dominating this particular market, plain and simple. Um, nobody mentioned IIS, and we gave them an the opportunity to do so. Um, Nginx usage as a web server has increased by 12%, um, which is, I think, a disruptive point to pay attention to. Um, the underdog here has basically dethroned the king. I mean, plain and simple. Nginx is taking over. It's, it's really an effective technology at what it does. And I think a key component of why it is as effective as it is is because it focuses on a smaller subset of tasks. It's identified those tasks, and it focuses to do those very well. Um, it's the key to why Linux is as stable as it is. It's the key to why Linux has been around as long as it is. If you are developing a project that is so infinitely complex that it's going to take weeks and months to figure out how to even start, you are doing it wrong, plain and simple. Data systems are increasing in complexity. We know this because we're seeing increases in replication across the board. Um, it's very interesting. Now. Uh, Single instances of MySQL are down roughly 28%. And this, you know, this is data. Take it with a grain of salt. I have a very specific subset of people that probably filled this out. They're likely a little more on the enterprise, but it's still an interesting statistic. A fair amount of this replication growth is a result of hosting providers that cater to Drupal. That's my wild ass assumption. Um, <laughs> there's no merit or basis to that, but it might be true. What we're seeing highlighted in some of these other slides is that people are using more and more hosting providers um, because it simplifies their process. It also locks them into a silo, so it's an interesting trade-off. So what's behind Drupal? Are you using Memcached? I'm, I'm surprised that we still have to ask this, but it, it is true, we do. Um, we've identified that... Yes, Redis actually uh, came up quite a bit, and, and I, I think that Sonnenbaum sent me a couple of tweets specifically about it. I'm joking. Um, but uh, you need to start looking at caching layers. You need to start looking at APC. You need to look in an opcode cache. You need to be able to, to use Redis, Memcache, Varnish, anything else in front of it. Um, Drupal needs a lot of help sometimes. These tools are very effective at reducing your infrastructure costs across the board. Um, if you are in a scenario where you're maybe dealing with some old metal, um, you need to get your entire organization's cost under control, it's a great way to have a high impact if you're not already using it. 
So basically, varnish has increased by 17%. Relative percentage of people not using this layer of caching has decreased by 20%. This is good. That means we're making the internet a better place. We're, we're improving people's experiences. We're addressing usability across the board as a result of it indirectly. It's all really cool how it ties together. The use of HA proxy is increasing. Um, you need to pay attention to that. HA proxy is a very valuable tool. It is something that you should really consider if you haven't already put it in your arsenal. Apache keeps losing market share. It's an interesting statement. It's not even a question anymore. They are losing market share. They're losing out to smaller, more efficient, more capable projects that are more focused. It's something to consider when you design your workflows and your business practices. Internal dedicated infrastructure is down by 9%. Less people are hosting in-house. More people are hosting in the cloud. Shared server usage has fallen by 14%. That is phenomenal. You're going to hear a lot about OpenShift. Um, it's a fantastic technology. It does a lot of really cool things. You should check it out. It probably has it will probably impact that number more significantly as we continue forward. And it's true. I mean, we're migrating to the cloud. If you need any further proof, I don't, I don't even know why you're here. <laughs> um, so basically what it boils down to is DevOps is kind of like a spiral or a spiral of life or whatever you want to call it. I'll go a little bit zen and holistic on everybody. Um, Think of it like a washing machine, right? When you're at the top point of that washing machine, you have something like, oh, we need to focus on project management. You come back down a little bit, and then, oh, well, project management's nailing it, but marketing's in the way. These guys are promising. These girls are promising all kinds of stuff that I, I can't deliver. So let's rein that in a little bit. So let's come down here and see what's left. Oh, development needs some improvement now, so let's let's call this DevOps, and let's go over here and do this thing. And then by the time you get to the top, it's not a perfect circle. You've solved points along the way. They may not be perfect solutions, but they are something that have improved your scenario and your situation. And when you come back around, you have the ability to get a little more focused and a little more effective, a little more surgical at what it is that you're doing. And you refine the message, and you keep doing it. Don't ever get stuck in the thought or the mindset that what you're doing right now is the only way to do it. It is the right way to do it. You will basically go broke if you do that. So the moment of Zen has passed, and I promised an iPad to the people that filled this thing out. I'm going to deliver. Uh, so I have put this into a third-party service. Uh, it can be audited by anybody that wants to. The link's out there on the uh, presentation that's checked into GitHub. It all ties together. It's kind of cool. This is the gentleman that won. Uh, his name is Nick LePage. Unfortunately, he is not here with us today. I sent him an email. He is, uh, I believe he said, rafting down the canals of Venice. Um, <laughs> I didn't want to interrupt him. I was like, that sounds cool. But uh, he won the drawing. And that's basically it. Uh, if you have any thoughts, there's a couple of really good places for you to focus. The first one is drupal.org slash DevOps. Um, I know it's a stupid word. I know that it sends the wrong connotation a lot of times, and I retract the use of the word stupid because obviously that's incorrect. Um, but it's a great place to have this conversation. There's a lot of people that are listening there. It's not used effectively, but that's because we need to come together and we need to figure out and identify how to use it to solve your problems. And I need help with that. I'm going to have a bop to discuss this very thing. I would encourage anybody that has any questions or, or just wants to talk, please show up. It's going to be fun. Um, it's going to happen this Thursday, 1045 to 1145. And evaluate this session. I mean, plain and simple, the DA works very hard to be able to put these shows together. If you don't give them the information that they need, like, hey, maybe this DevOps track needs to be restructured a little bit. Maybe it should be focused more on performance. Maybe it be, should be more security. They will not have that data or that feedback unless you give it to them, and we cannot adjust the content of these shows. So please do that. And that's it. Um, any questions? Did I scare everybody? <laughs> Sure. Uh, there's a microphone up here. If you could just form a line. We have about five minutes. Hello. 
Ciao, <laughs> apologize for my English. Totally fine. <laughs> uh, just a question about what is uh, the state of mind for network file system uh, on, uh, on with Drupal, for example, for synchronize the files directory between a lot of. Well, I, I think that, that by mindset, what it comes down to is, is testing. I think that, that first, most people need to understand what that is and what tools and components are involved in it. And, and the mindset comes about from showing people how to, to validate what it is that they're doing with those things and understanding what those things should be doing. And I think that, that for most people, that's the challenge right now. Um, if you'd like to, can, can I basically come to the BOF and let, let's sit down and talk, and I'll give you some okay, nice. really concrete examples. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. All right. Enjoy DrupalCon. Um, give a lot of feedback while you're here. Talk to people. The sessions are great, but I think that your real value is from the people that are around you. There's a lot of inter interesting conversations that you can have, and I encourage you to do so. Thank you.